And our next speaker is also from UIUC. Uh, take it away, Kristen. Good morning, everyone. I am Kristen Vaccaro, and today I'm presenting some work done with Professor Kerry Karahalios and Ranjitha Kumar at the University of Illinois, looking at the elements of fashion style. In fashion, outfits are created are characterized by high-level concepts. The use of the outfit, its appropriate environment, season, or even mood. So the outfit shown here might be a casual fall outfit for school or for a festival. And within an outfit, each of the fashion items are characterized by their design elements, including silhouette, color, pattern, material, trim, and designer. So this scarf might have a loop silhouette, a burgundy color, a geometric pattern, and a lightweight material. Fashion theorists have long wondered how to capture the correspondence between these fashion elements and styles. Seminal fashion theorist, Roland Bart asked how you can understand this mapping without reverting to intuition, writing that if I read a square-necked white silk sweater is very smart, it is impossible for me to say, without again having to revert to intuition, which of these four features, sweater, silk, white, or square neck, act as signifiers for the concept smart. To address this question, we present a data-driven fashion model that maps low-level elements to high-level styles. To do this, we adapt polylingual topic modeling to learn correspondences between elements and styles. I'll outline the usefulness of the polylingual topic model, the process for generating outfits under this model, and the results of inference to explain how this useful translation property is achieved. Polylingual topic modeling is a generalization of LDA topic modeling that learns how to represent concepts in multiple languages, in our case, a style language and an element language. One of the motivations for using polylingual topic modeling is that it allows you to translate between the languages. Traditionally, this is done between actual languages like English, Spanish, and Chinese, but here we can move from a style representation of an outfit to an element one and vice versa. To better understand how this works, I'll first explain how an outfit is created under the PLTM. First, you draw a set of fashion concepts or a fashion topic distribution for your new outfit from a Dirichlet with parameter alpha. In drawing this fashion topic distribution, some concepts will be more likely, like party, sexy, and holiday for the dressy outfit shown here, and some concepts will be much less likely like sportswear or edgy punk rock concepts for the same outfit. This single set of concepts will be expressed in each of the languages, one language for each of the documents you're creating. Next, because the outfit is represented with documents, you create all the words. In our case, this means words for one document in the style and one in the element language. For each word, you first draw a topic assignment, the same topic for both documents. And then, for each language, there's a word distribution for that topic drawn from a Dirichlet with parameter beta. So you draw an actual word for each document from the word distribution in that language, and this process repeats, drawing topics and words successively for each of the languages, style and element, until the full document is created in each of the languages for that outfit, and similarly for any other outfit. Once the model is trained, we can then infer fashion concepts for a new outfit. Here, the outfit is represented in an element document and also in an illustration. First, we can infer a topic distribution over the latent fashion concepts in that outfit. In addition, for each topic, we know the style word distribution for that topic and the element word distribution for the same topic. So here, we can see this outfit's fashion topic distribution is at the top with two topics much more important for this outfit than the 30 or so others. And we know that the topic labeled here one has frequent style words like prom, special occasion, and holiday, and element words like dress, um, shoe, and heel. And the topic labeled two has similar but distinct style words like night, sexy, and party, and element words like mini, sleeveless, and dress. Now, polylingual topic modeling offers a number of advantages the most significant being the ability to translate between the different languages that are used to represent each outfit, as I mentioned before. So given an outfit represented by a style document, 
we can translate through the topic representation to describe the same outfit in an element document and vice versa. To learn a PLTM for fashion, however, we require data that contains both style and element information. We use data from a popular fashion-based social network called Polyvore. On Polyvore, users create outfits by laying out fashion items on a mood board-like workspace. Outfits are labeled with titles and text descriptions that are provided by users, which often capture style information. So from the text descriptions here, we might learn that this outfit is a Valentine's Day outfit with concepts like boyfriends, couples, and romance, and that it's for cool sweater weather. Each of the items in the outfit have labels provided by Polyvore which describe their design elements. So the sweater here is labeled as a cardigan with a red color, long sleeve silhouette, and made by the designer Mango, and similarly for the other items. We process these two descriptions into a pair of parallel documents, one in the style language and the other in the element language. And we use these pairs of documents to train the PLTM. We train our models with over half a million outfits we collect from Polyvore and find that the resulting topics are quite coherent. We'll now show some of these topics and explain the validation process that's necessary to set one model parameter, specifically the right number of topics, highlighting the trade-off necessary between topic coherence and concept granularity. Here we show top words in both the style and element languages for four topics from a model trained with 25 topics. And I've labeled each one here with one or two of the style words to highlight the core concept. The first is a winter topic with style words like Christmas, winter, and fall, and element words like sweater, coat, black, long, leather, and wool. In the special occasion topic, we see style words like prom and party, and element words like dress, shoe, many, and sleeveless. And in the beach topic, we see style words like beach, summer, and swimming, with element words like hat, swimsuit, and bikini. Now, many of these topics are quite coherent, with words that are clearly related. However, the fourth topic begins to illustrate the trade-off between coherence and concept granularity. So, if we consider the model that's trained with 25 topics, the topic is quite coherent, with element words like boot, ankle booty, and lace-up. But the style words mention both military, with combat and army, and western, with cowgirl and cowboy concepts. If we instead train the model with 100 topics, these concepts break into separate topics, with one for military concepts and a separate one for western concepts. And we begin to see distinctions, like the idea that black lace-up boots are used in combat, whereas brown suede boots are used in western outfits. However, as the military topic here shows, the topic coherence decreases. So if you look at the fourth and fifth words in this topic, they're seriously in Florida, which are clearly less related to this concept. So in order to determine the right balance between topic coherence and concept granularity, we conduct two experimental validations. In the first, we set a bound for where users find topics coherent. And in the second, we set the actual number of topics for our model by testing the translation capability that actually powers our applications. Our topic coherence validation task is a method developed by Chang et al. called intruder detection. In this method, we select five highly likely words from a topic and one intruder that's very unlikely in that topic. We ask users to choose the word that does not belong and if they choose the intruder that's produced by the model, it indicates that the topics are tight and coherent. We crowdsource this task on Amazon Mechanical Turk and find that users do typically agree with the model, far above the baseline of random selection, which is shown by the blue dotted line here. We find that users find the topics most coherent between 15 and 50 topics, so we bound our second translation validation task to that range. We then use a second translation validation test to set the actual number of topics for our applications. In this task, we show users a set of words in the element language, here garland, pink, crown, floral, and flower, and ask them to pick the row of style words, here prom, um, wedding, the row with prom, wedding, and party, that are the best match compared to the others, like the row with proud, grunge, and skate and vice versa with prompts in the style words, selecting a row of element words. Here we find that the performance is similar 
in both directions, again, generally well above a random baseline, again shown by the blue dotted line, with the overall peak performance at 35 topics. So we use a model trained with 35 topics to power the three applications that we build to showcase what the translational capability of PLTMs can offer. So we'll cover three applications, one answering the age-old question from fashion theory, one building an automated style quiz, and one with an automated personal stylist. With the model trained with 35 topics, we can now answer Bart's question, both where he asks which design elements signify different styles, but also where he asks whether it's one word alone that is signifying the style, or whether many must come together to signify that style. Naturally, we can find which words are important for different styles. So considering the word distribution for a special occasion topic, which is the top row, we find that dress is the most important element. For a faded rock concept, jeans are most important. And for a military topic, boots are most important. However, we can also consider the entropy of the word distribution of the topic. So the three shown here have very low entropy. Clearly one word is carrying most of the information in these distributions. That is, one element is signifying that style. On the other hand, some distributions have relatively high entropy. That is, many words are carrying information. This suggests that for topics like beach, many elements, hat, swimsuit, bikini, and swimwear, must come together to create meaning. Similarly, in the bohemian topic, flower, wrap, crown, headband, floral, and backpack elements must all come together. And in winter, leather, long sleeve, coat, wool, and sweater, sweater come together as signifying elements. We can also build fashion applications that map onto existing needs. Our second application is based on a common site in fashion magazines, style quizzes, where a user answers a series of questions and is given their own style summary. Our model can power a style quiz that takes in much more natural input that can be updated quickly and easily with new trends. The user simply creates an outfit that they like or that they think captures their style. Since we have element descriptions of each item, we can extract an element document, translate through the topic representation, and provide a style summary to the user. So, for example, finding this summary outfit is a sexy retro beach outfit. And similarly for any other input, with an additional measure of how confident the model is in those style labels. Finally, we build an automated personal stylist so that personal style advice can be created at scale. In this application, a user simply describes in natural language what they want an outfit for. For example, I'm in town for New York Fashion Week and I'd like to find something flashy, maybe a little funky to wear to the shows. We extract the style words from their free description to create a style document. And as before, translate through topic space to elements. And we can then suggest items that are described by those elements. This application can provide recommendations for New York's Fashion Week, for going to a beach wedding, for modern masculine office wear, or even for a yoga retreat in Colorado all with guidance given in users' own natural descriptions. Now that we've built these applications and shown how data-driven models can power truly useful applications, we have a number of directions to explore. We want to explore new data sources, new models, and new applications. First, while we validated the model that actually powers these applications, we want to deploy them at scale in the wild and see how the model can incorporate user feedback, personalization, and context awareness into its recommendations. We've also seen how just a few elements of the Polyvore data can be used, but many remain. There are social signals like hearts and comments, and the network structure itself. There are temporal features and images we have not yet taken advantage of. And within the world of fashion, there are a huge set of fashion data sets that we haven't seen used much, if at all. So these include many streaming data sources, like product information that's updating daily, editorial content in runway and red carpet reviews, and social content produced by fashion models, fashion designers, and fashion thinkers. All, all of these could help us better understand fashion and how it changes over time. In this work, we showed the great power of a human interpretable model, 
one where we can make sense of design elements, styles, and the mapping between them. And we showed how that can help us understand the principles of design in one domain. We hope to see how these human interpretable models can power applications in other design domains, ranging from interaction to industrial to interior design in the future. Thank you. Hi, uh, Xin Ren from University of Michigan. I find your talk to be very, very interesting. So my question is, do you find there any overlap between element language and style language? Because, you know, element language is a collection of English words, and style language is also a collection of English words. And maybe, like, as your, one of your examples, you know, there are some styles specific to some elements. So, like, if you have any advice such overlap or any interesting patterns from there. Yeah, actually, um Figuring out what the right style words is actually kind of a tricky problem um, that I could actually talk about at great length. So you'll find that a number of things that we use in English to describe styles are also capturing element, design element information. So for example, saying that something's a cocktail dress, you know, you're telling people something about maybe the color and the silhouette, but you're also telling them the environment that it's appropriate for. So yes, absolutely there is overlap and sort of like detangling or disentangling those two can be, can be quite tricky. Um, this is awesome. I've never seen someone quantitatively test Bart's theories of fashion, so this is really cool. Um, uh, related to that, though, a lot of theorists that talk about uh, fashion and patterns will argue that the meaning systems vary depending on the groups that you're coming from. So, for example, an uh, article of clothing could mean one thing to people of a particular class and another to another group. So, have you thought about that? Um, if polyvore is kind of a universal truth, or if maybe how you'd incorporate other views of similar garments and their meaning? Yeah, that is absolutely a topic that I'm super interested in. So, you know, for example, there are some styles that only make sense in certain countries. Maybe it doesn't make sense to wear Western outfits in Europe. Or maybe like only Americans wear sneakers when they're walking around. Like there's kind of these common sense things that people talk about where styles don't don't really translate. Um, sorry, I lost track of the second thing that I wanted to mention. So, Oh, whether or not polyvore is a generalized, is like a general data source. Yeah, so actually one of the interesting things that we found is for polyvore itself, we ended up running a user study because not enough of the user data was transparent on the surface. So we conducted the survey with, with quite a few people, several hundred people, and we found that at least in the people who responded to our survey, the vast majority for, were from the United States. But you'll have these pockets of people who are from different areas. So the Philippines, for example, has a huge, huge interest in fashion, and they populate a lot of these social networks. So like on Polyvore, you'll find a lot of um, sort of more conservative outfits that are coming from the Philippines, and you'll find similar things on other social networks that people have done studies of. So yes, it absolutely is reflective of the people who, who are creating the data, and different, um, different social networks can sort of be reflective of different groups of people. So Lookbook, for example, is much more common in Europe. So you'll have a lot more European users, whereas Polyvore has a lot of people from the US. If we have one quick question while our next speaker sets up, we can take that. And you can use the mic. Hello. Hello. Uh, so the, the, my question is, um, so the decomposition of the, of the outfit into the elements doesn't imply that you can recompose back and to create like something that actually makes sense to you just by looking at the elements. Have you considered doing direct semantic uh, correlation or like uh, interpretation across different people who, who have different expressions, a complete expression of, of fashion? So not just looking at the topics, but doing like direct interpretation of the whole the statement into a semantic embedding of some kind and then compare that with another statement and see if 
the composition of this other person actually makes sense to you. Does that make sense what I'm saying? What I'm saying is like, instead of breaking it into parts, just compare the whole across different compositions and, uh, and see if people actually prefer that rather than going into the elements and trying to recompose something. Yeah, so looking at outfits as a whole is actually something that we that we try with this model. So can you do something like, you know, a common application in fashion is like, I want the same look for less. So I want to have an outfit that's very similar to this one that I've shown you, except I don't have that much money, so I'd like it to be less expensive. So similar style, similar look, but less money. So yes, that is definitely something that's possible with this model and something we hope to explore more. All right, let's take a speaker again.